was told that the, I should direct my lecture to um, beginning graduate students looking at the audience. I don't know. <laughs> Most of you look a little bit older than that, but um, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, so today, uh, I want to sort of set the scene and then uh, tomorrow um, go to some of the uh, applications uh, of homotopy uh, theory. So, the five work of mapping class groups and And really, there's a sort of a subtitle um, where I want to um, use is mainly homotopical methods. And indeed, some of the methods are really uh, stable homotopic theoretically. So, as I said, I want to discuss today mainly the sort of groups I have in mind, and then tomorrow uh, see how the homotopical method, what sort of homotopical methods um, can be used. So, uh, I already said, mapping class group and diffeomorphism groups. The, the groups, why these groups are particularly use, but, I mean, uh, meaningful for homotopical methods is because they have nice uh, spaces, geometric spaces as a classifying space, and that's of course a key point later on. So let me just introduce our main characters, really, um, and the groups. So uh, the first groups are actually the um, break group. So uh, they can be described to this in terms of generator simulations, uh, n minus one generators, and the rate group is just the uh, flip of the i's and the i plus one strand. And uh, I'll write down also the relations, and there are just two relations, namely if I have uh, two swaps which are far apart, then they don't interfere, and hence those two things commute. So if i and j are not adjacent, then uh, the corresponding swaps commute. And then there's a famous break relation, namely uh, a i j a i a j a i is just a j a i a j when have I'm going to write down also the symmetric group. So this is of course a bit too elementary. But uh, we can just think of the uh, symmetric group as having the same generators. I have those two relations and one more, namely that a i squared is just the identity. Where's the geometry of these? Well, uh, I like to think of, well, there are two different ways of thinking of this. The break group is, um, I can think of it as the fundamental group of the points endpoints in a two disk. So here I have n points, four points actually, in a, uh, in a disk and uh, the configuration space, well it's a space of all possible uh, locations of those four points and if I don't have a path now, if I want a path here, that means I have a path between this picture back to itself, but in between these points may take any sort of um, position. So I really get a correct and that's the um, relation here. Similarly, I can also think of as a symmetric group as a configuration space of uh, the infinite. Well, actually, it's already pi 
I1 of uh, the configuration in G3, because once I have an extra dimension, the braiding, I can move uh, strings past each other. But uh, I like to think of it as um, pi 1 of this infinite one, mainly because um, this here is actually a k pi 1, so this is actually a classifying space for the break group, Pn. And similarly, this here, as I go, um, as the disk goes to infinity, and the dimension of the disk, this <coughs> is actually a classifying space of the symmetric group. So, uh, really, this is what I mean. I have very nice models for the classifying spaces of this group. But in a moment, I also am going to talk about mapping class groups. So I really also want to think of as the first one, at least, as a mapping class group. So really, I um, can write this as pi naught associated to the different morphisms which are orientation preserving of the disk, the two disk, where I take out n points. So it is also, the break groups are also a mapping class group. Now, uh, how do I think of the symmetric group as a mapping class group, or indeed I can think of it as a diffeomorphism group, of course, and that is uh, somewhat trivially, but uh, sort of important is the diffeomorphisms of endpoints. Okay? Endpoints are a zero-dimensional manifold, and the symmetric groups is a diffeomorphism group of those. <coughs> And that will come in actually uh, at uh, you know, some nice point of view. Okay. So, uh, let me then get to the mapping class groups. The mapping class groups, M, G, K. Okay. Uh, well, I start off with the diffeomorphism groups of an orientable surface of genus G and uh, K boundary components. So, the picture here is surface of genus G. And this particular one has two boundary components. And I want to consider all the different morphisms. And since the surface is oriented, though, I take those that preserve some orientation. And I also want to consider those that, for the moment at least, fix the boundary pointwise. So that's my intention. So different morphisms of uh, our surface. And that fixes it boundary pointwise. The mapping class group, by definition, is just the connected components of this with, um, topological group. <coughs> and the specific uh, special case in dimension two is that you see, I always have, of course, the group with <coughs> all different morphisms. I can just I get, in some sense, the um, structure I can map from the group itself to the connected components, that's a group homomorphism. And the special case here is that this is actually a homotopy equivalence as soon as the Euler characteristic of the surface we are um, talking about is less than zero. So as soon as G is um, two or bigger than uh, these two groups up to homotopy have to 
the same information, which is rather special. And of course, the same I might like to do for uh, non-orientable surfaces. So let's denote. Actually, before I go that, okay. So it's uh, sort of nice to see what sort of elements do I have in this um, group. Well, uh, what about the cylinder? Okay, what well, so might be class group of the cylinder? That's the surface. And if I want to fix the boundary, then I can look at one uh, curve, namely this one here in the middle. And I can do the following thing. I can cut the cylinder along the pink surface and twist one side completely by um, 360 degrees and glue it back. So the way to indicate what such a diffeomorphism does It's really by saying what happens to a curve that cuts along. So if I look at this curve here, then by this same trace that I just explained, what happens is that this curve will be mapped into something that goes up behind the curve and comes back on the other side. This is what we call a Dean twist around the curve A. And indeed, the mapping class group of the cylinder is just generated by that and freely generated, so the mapping class group of the cylinder is just equal to Z. More generally, I can look at curves, closed curves like this. I have these connecting curves. that go in a hole and back another hole, or I have these curves that go around a hole. And it turns out that uh, really, uh, the mapping class group is generated by such game twists. So, where A is any simple plus curve. That's, that's enough to look at a simple plus curve. <coughs> Excuse me, um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. Uh, um, can, can you explain me again, uh, like with this, uh, this as a marking, I don't think, uh, I'm the definition of this. Uh... Uh, sorry, let's <coughs> this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, so it's just a general way. thing. When you have a topological group, uh -huh. uh, very simple example, take um, O, N. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, I can just look and I associate to every element here just the element uh, it defines in the components. <coughs> so for um, how many, a pi naught of O, N is just uh, Z mod 2. Okay, because right. it has uh, two connected yeah. components. Yeah, so two connected components. Okay. So uh, so what is the map in this case? You could, um, well, it's you know, given by the orientation. A matrix A uh, goes to uh, one or minus one. Okay. So duplicatively, thinking depending on what the term uh, is, it's determinant. Right? So the determinant here will actually provide actually this homomorphism, but you can just send it to the component plus or minus one. And I don't even have to write down anything. So else. you're like retracting every component to a point. Uh, That's right. 
Okay, and you are doing the same there with the diffeomorphism of this. Uh, object. And I'm doing the same for these diffeomorphisms. The diffeomorphism group is in, well, infinite dimensional group, of course, right? I mean, I can uh, just look at a little disk and wiggle it a little bit, and that's a diffeomorphism, right? And I can, uh, well, I, that's already an infinite dimensional group, just looking at the so disk and looking at its diffeomorphism. So it's a huge space, uh, but if I think about it into more topologically, you know, uh, how complicated is this space, then uh, for this it's really quite trivial, it's sort of always connected to the identity. So the connected components in particular here is just one uh, orientation. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, that is, this is sort of uh, the idea uh, we are doing here. The diffeomorphism group is huge. Let's see what we can do in, on the connected components and some things. Uh, that's the idea. And um, uh, it's a theorem that actually uh, the connected component of the diffeomorphism of the uh, surface of high enough genus is actually contractible. So there's no higher homotopy, so no higher homology for the group itself. Does that make sense? This, by the way, is not, of course, a homotopy yeah. equivalence, right? I mean, here, yes. uh, you have uh, the kernel is S O N, and that yeah, has lots of higher homotopy and homology. So it's a very special case of the idea. Uh, we are now talking about this is a discrete group, and I'm thinking about um, how can I describe generators and relations. And this goes back to um, theorems by Thurston and Thatcher, first, um, really the first set of generators and relations. And that's, uh, we know it's all given by game twists. That's even older. And uh, first I had to also wrote down some relations. But um, I won't even write down a complete set. It's not so complicated to write down a complete set. The important part for us, I want to note here, is the following. So if I have a curve like this one, let's call this A, and this one B, then a dent twist around this curve and a dent twist around that curve, of course, they will not interfere with each other because uh, the Dean twist is something that just happens very locally um, on my surface. So a diffeomorphism that is only uh, non-trivial here and a diffeomorphism that's only non-trivial on the uh, neighborhood of this curve, they don't interfere. So we get actually that the, uh, the Dean twists around these two curves commute. So when do they commute? Uh, when, um, whenever the curve A uh, does not intersect the curve B. And similarly, we can uh, easily be checked. <laughs> actually, this is an exercise. If I have actually that the two curves intersect in one point, so, for example, this one and this one, you can see, then uh, we actually get the break relation. So, this is the one. And uh, I haven't actually, uh, I only written down a sum of the closed curves. If I just put in one more here, then actually all those pink curves now generate uh, the mapping class group. And these are the relations, and I have a few more. <coughs> but uh, my point is here, you can just write it down. So, excuse me. Yeah. Can you choose A and B canonically? A and B. Generators A and B. No. Can, uh, so are, these are, the so these are dead twists around closed curves, uh, closed curves. So, 
I can pick certain plus simple curves, right? Uh, now I'm looking at the different, um, not just at the different morphism group, but at its mapping class group. So in this picture, whether I pick this curve or say this curve, in the mapping class group, they're the same because they're homotopic. Yes. Yeah. But can't I interchange the A's and B's by a diffeomorphism of some sort? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. So, so, uh, so uh, this is not supposed to be kind of something like that. But I'm yeah, just I'm saying, sorry, I if I picked, yeah, I have surface, and I picked exactly the ones I'm given, and this extra one, then these will actually generate the whole thing. Not, not canonically, but there will be a set of generators. So in particular, it's uh, finitely generated, and it's finitely represented. And uh, these relations that I've written down are very uh, straightforward uh, to check. OK. So uh, one of the reasons I uh, wanted to uh, write this down explicitly um, first of all, there's of course a map from the break group into the symmetric group by just, well, we're just adding another relation. So that's uh, a straightforward way to do it. And here, we of course can always do this <coughs> by just, um, well, going from configurations in the disk to configurations in the infinite disk. And uh, that's just a, a, the same map. But I, I wanted this particular. Um, writing this particular relation because we see now that the break group has a very nice map into this mapping class group as well. Because the AIJs, if I now delabel these A1, A2, etc., up to A2, G, to G plus 1, I see that if I send the AI to those AIs, the interest around those AIs, then uh, I get actually a well-defined map because they uh, satisfy these uh, relations. So I get a map from uh, B uh, to G plus 2, and it maps into the mapping class called uh, G comma, well, let's be precise, uh, to boundary components. Or I can also close this up doing a pair of paths, and I have one more generator around this curve. This is A2 G plus 2, and I get a map from um, the break um, of 2G plus 3 into gamma g plus one, 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 one. So these have uh, played an, in, um, well, uh, play an important role, and uh, Weinberg um, calls these actually geometric. whether there are any known geometric embeddings. So geometric because these spread relations which you have from the day twist, they just maps right to there. And the question was, are there any other maps from the break group into the mapping class group which are not given by something like that? OK. So uh, I want to also introduce another group. Um, which is just an analog really for non oriented mapping class groups. So here I have, um, this is a knot of the diffeomorphisms of a non oriented world surface. Okay. That's fixed. So non oriented <laughs> surface, uh, well, is of course given by the number of cross caps and k is the number of boundary components. And again, 
Yeah, it's a term that it's a diffeomorphism of group itself. I sort of canonical map down, and again, this is a homotopy equivalence as soon as the Euler characteristic is in of the underlying surface. So again, similar as our course. How are these two related, the mapping class group and the non-orientable um, mapping class group? So I have an, a nice map, of course, of the say, mapping um, surface of genus G, which is orientable. And I can just glue in one cross cap. And so I get a map from gamma G1 into the non-orientable one of G is 2G plus 1 and no Every and This is simply an uh, Euler characteristic uh, calculation. So I can extend a diffeomorphism of this surface because I fix the boundary but via the identity of the glued on uh, surface and I get a homomorphism on diffeomorphism groups, which then gives me a homomorphism on map. Vice versa, I think it's quite uh, useful to note, is that, uh, by the way, this is nearly uh, onto the kernel here, oh, sorry, this, um, this is nearly embedding. The kernel here is actually exactly the Dean twist. So the kernel is given by the Dean twist around the bundle. On the other hand, uh, if I have a orientable surface, which I embed nicely in R3, so that uh, J, which is just minus the identity, maps the surface to the surface, yeah. then I can write actually uh, this is also the same as all those elements in the mapping class group. So these are all the elements phi in the mapping <coughs> class group, gamma plus minus, of um, G minus one. Get the right numbers. G minus one, and possibly G boundary components. So all of those that actually are diffeomorphisms of this uh, and come from diffeomorphisms of this thicker surface, which commute this chain. Right out of space here. So all of these such that. Uh, J phi is the same as phi J. Sorry about that. So it's a commutator in this bigger group of J. In other words, the non orientable ones are actually a subgroup. Okay. <coughs> One more group I have to mention, and that connects to, uh, with uh, really this uh, Karen's uh, talk in a moment. Then is the automorphisms of a free group. <coughs> they are not really a mapping class group, but they are very closely related. Namely, I want to think <coughs> of these as a coming not from some different morphism, but from homotopy equivalences of a wedge of S mass. And indeed, <coughs> this is for the mapping class groups. Uh, if I look at the homotopy equivalences of a wedge of S mass, this is homotopy equivalence. Okay? So, really, 
yeah, I look at three groups and its automorphisms, I can think of it as this more geometric uh, space. So homotopy equivalences of, well, this is really a graph of n um, loops. Okay. <coughs> there are now two maps into this. Um, that's why I have one of the reasons. So how does this connect up with these break groups and the symmetric group? Well, clearly the symmetric group maps into here by just permuting the generators of the free group. But I also have a more, and then of course the break group maps into that, and so on. And like that. But the break group has a more interesting map in there, <laughs> namely this, the homotopy equivalences of pi 1, uh, sorry, of a uh, batch of S1s, is actually the same as the homotopy equivalences of a disk minus n points. Up to homotopy, that's the same, and therefore the homotopy equivalences are going to be the same. So really, I now have a map from the different morphisms of the two endpoints removed into the homotopy equivalences. And this, of course, pi naught of this, reduced map on pi naught, this is the break. So this map here is the so-called after map. <coughs> and it's not simply, it's conjugate to so one of the generators. So, yeah. so, one place which I got slightly confused is with labeled versus unlabeled. So the, the configuration space, the beta n right is, is pi 1 of the unlabeled uh, sorry, here, you mean? Yes. Right, uh, so when I look at these configuration spaces, um, these are all uh, unlabeled. So I don't worry about the uh, order of C. So the idea is that in the, the, cir the circles, the, the closed curves on the surface, there's no way to canonically label them. That's why we get the map. Um, I'm just confused because in F, FM, right. out of FM. So, okay, so there are different, um, different ways of uh, to look at this. Um, right, okay. So when I look at, um, this, this is supposed to be the picture that connects this with this, right? When I say, okay, well, uh, I run off this, but I, I have to start at the base point, right? Pi 1 has to start at the base point. And there are names. And they have to be, I mean, I don't have to order them, but they have to have names. So I might as well call them out. Now, uh, because I'm in the unlabeled one, uh, if this is going to be, of course, the same thing, but you see, this point here is going to a different one here. And that's okay, because uh, the unlabeled one doesn't remember the ordering. So it's just the set of points that is important. So uh, the unlabeled um, um, configuration, the fact that it's unlabeled, comes in <coughs> allowing pictures that connect something here to something, a different point here. I'm just preserving the same And that's of course the great mm -hmm. yeah. Excuse me. In this diagram where you <coughs> we've mapped diffeomorphisms to homotopy equivalences, I'm assuming yeah. that diagram commutes there, does it? Is it obvious that corresponds to forgetting it over or under on the left hand side? Is that a commutative <coughs> diagram? This does not commute. Sorry. I, I, I should sorry. say that. Does not commute. Oh, and in some sense, uh, it's a theorem that in homo homology it does, which is some, what's surprising. 
it definitely doesn't do it. And indeed, the image here is, um, well, okay, this is an inclusion, so the image here is finite, while this is also an inclusion, and the image will be infinite. So they're very different. Uh, it's a, 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 the sub diagram, which has the braid group in the bottom <coughs> and the symmetric group. Yes. And then you've got the braid group is pi zero <coughs> diffeomorphisms. Are you going to, <coughs> is there a connection between the symmetric group above the braid group there and the homotopy equivalences? Yes, there. No. No. Okay. No. Definitely not. Uh, this is just a way of writing uh, the antimorphism. <coughs> That's, yeah. that's the connection. You don't want an equals there, you want an inclusion. It's not true that every diffeomorphism, uh, every automorphism of the free group is realized on a homotopy equivalence? Yes. This is an inclusion, but homotopy equivalence is the same. Homotopy equivalence. The uh, monoid of homotopy equivalences up to uh, of some spaces only determined uh, by the homotopy part of the underlying space. Just okay, maybe homotopy equivalences are not <laughs> so familiar, but uh, homotopy equivalence you can compose. So a priori, uh, that's just a monoid. But the space of homotopy equivalences of uh, so homotopy equivalences of the space X are going to be homotopic to the homotopy equivalences of the space Y as soon as X and Y are homotopy equivalent. So, yeah. Just a comment on Tony's question. There is a way to put the gray group and the symmetric group together, the gray permutation group, which lives in part of her family. That's a bigger group, though. Yeah, it's a bigger group. The well sort of for the well uh, yeah. right. which for some the That's well not raises. something I'm considering. Yeah. Just. <coughs> so um, this is supposed to be setting the scene of what sort of uh, groups one might uh, consider and the sort of maps you get from the geometry. Now, uh, at the moment, I've just looked at, um, well, relatively, well, discrete groups. Ultimately, these are all discrete groups. And, but they're coming from uh, things that are topological group. And you might wonder uh, what happens when we increase the dimension of these different morphism groups. So nearly this is nearly as um, think of it as a separate line of inquiry, right? Different morphism groups of manifolds are obviously a fundamental um, object. Manifolds are and so are different morphisms. And you are, might ask you a question, uh, what can we say about different morphism groups of a given manifold? Now I very uh, simplistic here look at dimension zero, that's a symmetric group. The diffeomorphism, so we sort of feel we understand those. The diffeomorphism of S1 are homotopic to S1, and then of course many copies just permute them. So the, this is already yep. up, up to homotopy, the only thing I can do really is rotate S1. And then you might ask, what about higher dimensional ones? So we look at surfaces, and we sort of understand them a little bit better. But then, what about higher dimensions? So um, let me just. Sorry, could you clarify that? I'm sorry, the statement diffeomorphisms of S1, RS1, that you wrote. Homotopy equivalent. Oh. So S1, of oh, course, I'm, I'm, rotates, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I okay, and then yeah, yeah. it's homotopy no, equivalent. Sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, not equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <coughs> right. So, uh, I want to 
also precious. Uh, what sort of questions can we ask and what sort of questions can we answer this is um, well, looking at it from a heat of view. So really I'm thinking about it in terms of Google uh, homology. So in other words, I'm really thinking about, if I think about spaces, what is um, the homology of the classifying space? <coughs> Uh, group generated by all these DNA twists 
and the same sort of in relation. And then there was another relation which I didn't write down, which basically equates uh, some even number with some odd numbers of generators. And so actually, it's a very easy computation from the presentation that that is. Uh, and I need here uh, G to be um, predicted. <coughs> and similarly, ah, I didn't write this down. What are the generators of uh, the um, non orientable Latin class group? Well, one way to get a non orientable Latin class group is by um, gluing on this cap cross cap, so Möbius band, onto um, the surface of genus G, or antical plane. And of course I have the same sort of generators, and have all the Dean twists, but I need one more. So the generators of some non-orientable mapping class groups are the Dean twist as before, but I need one more generator, and that's the so-called um, cross side. Slide. <coughs> which um, is following. So in my non orientable map um, surface, I must have somewhere a Möbius band. That's my picture of a Möbius band. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, I need to have something of genus at least um, two. The cross cap slide is just looking at the core of this Möbius band. Mm. And I take a cross cap that's somehow sitting on this Möbius band. And I just slide it around. So it comes back flipped. And that's a cross cap slide. Uh, which is a generator of an uh, additional generator that one needs. And it turns out that, of course, all the Dean twists vanish as in the uh, non orientable bucket class group. And here, the only thing left is really the cross cap slide, and it just gives me a set or two. This is for G. Set. So what's the general approach now um, to try to um, answer these uh, questions? Well, sometimes the problem gets easier when you make it harder, and this is certainly the case. So instead of looking at one group at a time, you look at them all together. So the approach is to consider all, all GN. Now, I don't mean mapping class groups uh, or non orientable or orientable, uh, you know, all the different types. I mean one type at a time. So all the symmetric groups, all the, or all the break groups, or all uh, gamma Gs, or all N Gs. So consider them together, and the point is really that we get extra structure. And it's really very simple, for example, on the break groups, you have, of course, the map that takes braids uh, on n springs, cross braids on n springs, to braids on n plus n springs, by just putting them next to each other. And similar with the symmetric groups. And for the mapping class group, you can do something like this. Uh, you have something that lives on the surface of genus G, and something that lives on the surface of genus H, and you can just glue them together, those two surfaces, and now you have something that lives on the surface of genus G plus H. So we get extra structure 
on the homology when we look at all of them together. So then the idea is to understand, try to understand with this extra structure, uh, the infinite, the limit of G infinity. And this is where the geometric model Um, model for P G N and hence P G infinity comes in. That's the key point here. And finally, and that's already indicated, of course, in the last question here. What one wants to prove is somehow a homology stability. from the infinite case to the finite case. So what I mean by homology stability, let me just write that.